and you may be seated. His clothes were tattered and torn, hanging from his emaciated body. His face covered with nodules disfigured beyond recognition. His hair falling out, and where it was left, it was disheveled. His body was breaking down right in front of him, his skin scaly and patchy. You know, he couldn't even tell you how long it had been since he'd felt the touch of another human. All he knew is that one day he noticed a spot discolored on his skin, so he took his time to get over to the priest, and he presented himself to the priest, hands shaking as he showed him, uncertain of what this might mean, and before he knew it, he was diagnosed with leprosy, and told that, that if he loved his wife and kids, that he should never go near them again, and he desperately wanted to just go home and hold his wife and explain everything, and to, to kiss his daughter goodnight, to wrestle with his boys just one more time. But he couldn't, because he's contagious. So with that diagnosis, he was forced to leave everything he knew and everyone he loved, and he moved to the outskirts of town where human touch would never come as an option. And if ever he did interact with anybody else or get near somebody else, he had to scream, unclean, unclean. That way they couldn't get close enough that they might brush up against him and accidentally contract this disease. And so his life became one of slowly rotting in isolation. This man didn't know where to go from here, and there was nothing left for him. And so he was on the outskirts of town, no one there to care for him. Maybe he would be lucky enough for once in a while his family would bring him a, a meal, set it on a rock, and leave and so that he could come and pick it up, and they might watch from afar, but that's about it. And so it was a bold move when he decided to approach Jesus that afternoon. Everybody watched, and they couldn't understand why this leper, who was shunned by society, unclean, would be approaching Jesus. Yet here he came, dragging that near lifeless leg behind him and approaching closer than he'd ever gotten to another human being in years. Let's pick up the story, Luke 5, verse 12. And this is where we're going to come this morning. If you've been with us for the last little while, you know we're trekking through the Gospel of Luke. It's the Jesus story. We're seeing Jesus in real color and who he is and what he means for us today. And it's, as we come to Luke 5, verse 15, it's an encounter that we're not soon to forget. But before we dive in, would you just pause here with me and let's go to God and ask him to guide our time in his word. Almighty God, thank you for the truth of your word and for the incredible way that you still speak through it today. God, we know that you're here, that you're not far off, that you're, you're in this place. Your Holy Spirit indwells those who believe and is in this church. And God, thank you for your people. And for these truths, I ask that you'd give us the courage to apply them to our lives and to live well for you in the week ahead. God, anything of my preparation that isn't of you, just strip it away. And, and God, I ask that you would teach us this morning. In your name, amen. So here we go. Let's join the story. Luke 5, verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Now, can you picture the scene? Can you picture it unfolding? Jesus is out with his newly minted disciples that we heard about last week, just enjoying an afternoon in the sun, and everything's going swimmingly until this contagious leper enters the scene and approaches Jesus. And now nobody knows what to do. See, leprosy was this contagious disease. To know, you know, it's this word that's familiar. We hear about leper colonies or to treat somebody like a leper, but the concept really is pretty foreign to us because of advances in modern medicine. We don't see it in the West. 
Today we know it as Hansen's disease. It, it forms nodules on the face that would sometimes break open and the smell was putrid. It would, it would cause them to lose, uh, you know, patches of their skin. They'd become discolored, but it wasn't all superficial. You see, the nerves would be damaged in such a way that sensation would be lost. They wouldn't be able to feel things or feel temperature of things. And so it was not uncommon for lepers or those with Hansen's disease to lose limbs or fingers or a nose or an ear that they would injure themselves and, the, and through that to lose them. Or one researcher writes about watching his patients sleep at night and rats would come out and chew at the flesh and they'd wake up without pieces of themselves that they had when they went to sleep the night before. But they never rustled uh, because they couldn't feel it. That's Hansen's disease, leprosy. But in scripture, it really is broader than that. It's broader than that. It's not just this disease that desensitizes us. And it kind of sounds almost like our sin, doesn't it? You know, we start down this, this road, and we do something, and maybe it hurts at first, but over time we get desensitized to it. We don't even feel it anymore. And we don't realize it's leading to our death. That's, that's a picture of our sin, if you ask me. But as you look at leprosy in Scripture, it's this Greek word lepra. And lepra really means scaly. And it's broader. It includes other skin diseases like psoriasis or lupus or ringworm or other things like that. But as I think of this definition of scaly, it, it makes me reflect back on when I moved back to California 10 years ago. And a few months in, it was August, it was a Wednesday afternoon, and I had lunch with a friend, and I noticed my hands were, were drier than normal. You know, they'd be dry sometimes, I'll lotion them up, and we're, we're good to go. But at this point, they're like flaking back, they're scaly and peeling almost like snake skin, and it started to kind of freak me out. So I'm losing, using these lotions, nothing's helping, so I go to the doctor. And the doctor gives me the number of a specialist. And the specialist looks at my hands, and he says, well, I, I know what I'm going to do this weekend. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to study up my medical books. Awesome. Because that's what all of us want to hear when we go to the doctor, right? Stumped him. And, and so he comes back the next week. He says, so Phil, here's what I think you have. Is, it's called keratolysis exfoliativa. And I just throw those Latin words out there so I sound smart for a minute. But really, here's all it means. Is that my, my skin, my epidermis, was peeling back almost like a snake, peeling and, and shedding its skin. And it, my, it was just, you know, exfoliating right in front of me. And I, and I couldn't stop it. And so he threw a bunch of medical lotions at me, and, and nothing worked. And while nothing made it better, there were things that made it worse. Water, for instance. Good luck avoiding that one, right? And so showers became shorter. And, and I came home and I told Krista, I'm like, sweetheart, doctor says I can't wash the dishes anymore. Like, man, you know. I know, babe, I know. I'm bummed too. I get it, you know. And my wife, you know, you know some of you know my wife, and she's incredibly sensitive. She's super caring. And so she, she went out and got a pair of cow print rubber gloves for me just so I'd look ridiculous doing it now. And, and so she, she goes, does that, so I didn't get off the hook for that, and I, uh, this was hard to live with, though. So months down the line, I mean months go on, nothing's helping. And so I go on vacation to Hawaii, and I'm out there for the whole week, and I'm on the beach, and I'm enjoying the sun, and I'm looking at this crystal clear blue water just dancing in the sunlight. And I so wanted to get in, but I couldn't, because water softens the skin and made it peel more. And so the whole week, I'm sitting there, and I'm just wishing I could get in the water, and I can't get in the water until the last day. Finally, I'm like, you know what? Forget it. I'm getting in the water. I want it. I'm going surfing. So I get in, and I'm surfing for a little while, and I'm just looking at my hands, and I'm waiting for them to just fall off. You know, like, I'm not, even, I'm not making this up. I'm just looking at them like, it's going to happen. And it didn't. In fact, the next day, the next two days, all of a sudden, they started getting better. And I realized, could it be... That, that this salt water actually is making it better. And so I go and I tell Krista, I'm like, Krista, I figured out how to fix this. We need a beach house. <laughs> and she didn't go for that either. Like, she gives me nothing, I'm telling you. Okay, and so, so I come back and I call the doctor. And I'm like, Doc, you couldn't figure it out, but I think I did. I think salt water makes it better. And he's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm like, thanks a lot, Doc. And so, so I said, so I say, here's the deal. I think since I found the cure, you should name the disease after me. And he didn't go for it either. Uh, but, which I don't get, by the way, because like Scott Hansen has leprosy named after him. I don't get a disease named after me. Like I want a disease named after me. And they wouldn't do it. And so here I am. Here's my point. Here's my point. If I lived in Jesus' day, 
that would have qualified as a defiling skin disease. That would have probably made me shunned by society. I would have had to move to the outskirts of town. I would have not been able to see or hold my family again. I would have been looked at like a leper. But here's this man. And he comes to Jesus, and he's not just looking at hands that are falling apart. This isn't a new thing. He is covered with leprosy, we read. Covered, head to toe. His body is covered with leprosy. This is exhaustive. It's been there for years. This is not a new thing that maybe we can reverse it real quick. No doctors had been able to help. Surfing in the salt water of the Mediterranean didn't help. Nothing helped. And so he lived in isolation for years. Dress in torn clothes and to keep his hair unkempt. Just a glance at him and you knew you should stay away. Because here's the perspective of, of lepers in that day. It was understood that anything that touched a leper would be contaminated. He was unclean, ceremonially unclean, and every part of him was contaminated. And therefore, anything that he touched was contaminated. Anything that touched him was contaminated. Anything that touched what he touched was contaminated. So he could pet your dog and pat your dog on the head, but that dog would now have to be killed. If he walked in your home, your home would need to be raised to the ground because it was now contaminated. That was the perspective of the, clean, or the unclean, uncleanliness of this leper. Everything about it contaminated. And so he was kept in isolation because he's contagious. But when he heard of Jesus, when he heard that Jesus was passing through, he just had to see him. See, nothing had brought him hope before. No doctor, no salt water, nothing had brought him hope before. But he'd heard stories of Jesus healing countless people in Capernaum. He'd heard of Jesus driving out demons, and he heard of this power. He heard of this teaching, and he had to go and see Jesus. And so this leper, he approaches Jesus. And all the, the disciples and others around Jesus, they, they kind of part to let him come close. And I envision this, this pathway open up because nobody around Jesus wants to be the first to touch him or to accidentally bump into him. And conspicuously absent from this scene are the words that dripped from his mouth every single day, many times a day, unclean, unclean. And instead they're replaced with a, a silence as everybody watches in horror to see how this scene would unfold. And he comes close to Jesus, and he bows down with his face to the ground, and he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And this man, he's bold, he's humble, He's desperate, but he's not demanding. And he comes before Jesus, and in these words, I hear faith. I hear a deep confidence. I hear a hope that he has never had before. But yet there's still this question. The question isn't if Jesus is able. He knows he's able. The question is if Jesus is willing. Because after all, he's cursed by God. He's contaminated. Nobody would want to get near him. And this is where our story gets really good. Look at verse 13. Jesus reached out his hand and touched this man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Now, now this is not what I expected as I read the story. You know, Jesus could have just uttered a word and healed him from a distance. We know Jesus has that power, but he doesn't say a word from a safe distance. Instead, he comes closer still, and he reaches out his hand, and he touches the man. And immediately, the leprosy left him. This is what's so beautiful about Jesus, is that he touches the untouchable. Jesus touches the untouchable. You can't say that about just any religious figure, but you watch Jesus in the Gospels, and he reaches out. He touches those that nobody else will get near. He moves closer to those who are shunned by society, the down and out, the rejects, and he comes close, touching the untouchable. And as he does, this man is healed instantly. But it's not just his body 
that's healed. It's his heart, it's his mind that are healed as well. It's not just physically, but emotionally this man is healed as well because he hasn't, he's longed for years for somebody to touch him. He's yearned for that sensation again, just to know that somebody noticed, that somebody cared about him. And it's been years since he's felt it. See, he was still living, sure, but to everyone around him, he was basically dead. Now Jesus comes close, and this man, he, 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 he's bowed down to the ground, and he glances up, not expecting much, but hoping for something. And instead of the glares that he's seen his whole life, he's met with love in Jesus' eyes. Instead of curses, he's met with sweet, kind words from the mouth of Jesus. And then he, and then he feels something that he hasn't felt in years. It's the touch of a human hand. Through his response, Jesus makes him human again. Touch is a powerful thing, isn't it? I'm told that we need something like 8 to 12 touches a day to make us healthy. And it's not uncommon if you go into Eastern Europe to see orphanages where kids, babies, spend 22, 23 hours a day in a crib untouched. Maybe even receiving bottle feedings from bottles that are propped up because there's not enough people to be there to, to feed the babies. And these babies, they fail to thrive. They die young. Their growth is stunted. Their emotional and physical and brain development is all diminished because of this lack of touch. Other studies have shown that healthy touch increases in children the ability to bond with parents and others throughout their life. It shows that, that it lowers depression in kids as well. Man, we need healthy touch, don't we? Can you imagine being this man living years without it? Henri Nouwen, a, a revered theologian, he, he was a professor at Notre Dame. He stepped down from positions like that just to go and to be a chaplain with adults with special needs. An incredibly humble move for such an intellect. And he writes these words, he says, When we honestly ask ourselves which person in our lives means the most to us, we often find out that it's those who, instead of giving advice, solutions, or cures, have chosen, rather, to share our pain and to touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand. That's exactly what we see in Jesus, isn't it? That's what we see in Jesus right here. He reaches out and touches this untouchable. And in so doing, he reverses the scheme of ev what everybody expected to happen. It's completely reversed. See, everybody expects that when he touches the untouchable, that he would now become untouchable. That when he touches the unclean, he would now become ceremonially unclean. But instead, it's the exact opposite that happens. Jesus isn't contaminated. See, they, they look at this and they expect that, that he will now be contaminated by this man. But instead, when Jesus comes into contact with this man, instead of that man's contagion hitting Jesus, Jesus is spreads his contagious holiness and grace to that man, stopping leprosy in its tracks and reversing the progress of that, of that disease and of that sin and anything in his life. Jesus spreads his grace and holiness to him. It's a fascinating thing, you see, because Jesus doesn't just, doesn't just touch the untouchable, but he cleanses the unclean. He cleanses the unclean. He reverses what has been done and he restores what's been lost. That's Jesus. His holiness, his grace, they're so powerful and so contagious that they change everything. You know, in this scene, I love it because this is what God does on a personal level. But at the same time, it's a model for us of what Jesus does through us as well. You know, if we're Christians this morning... If you call yourself a Christian, that means little Christ. And if you're to be a little Christ, then we get to live in something of the same way. This is a model for us to follow in how we interact with an unbelieving and hurting world around us. See, I mean, let's be honest. We live in a world that's hurting and broken, aren't we? Like, we look all around and, and we hear of, of corruption, of scandals, of, of school shootings and sexual abuse, and it doesn't even surprise us anymore. Our world is a total mess. 
It's hurting and broken, and it needs Jesus' touch. But unfortunately, what we do is all too often, we Christians, we step back and we isolate ourselves from the hurting world around us. We build such a buffer between us that we could never reach out with God's grace because we're more concerned with not being contaminated. It's, it's almost like we look like this kid from that classic, It's a Christmas Story. Watch this scene and tell me if you see something familiar. Come on, Mom, we're gonna be late. Hi, Ralph. My kid brother looked like a tick about to pop. What? What is it? What is it? Oh. What is it? I can't put my arms out. Well, put your arms down when you get to school. kind of like that sometimes, isn't it? I love this scene, but, it, but it's sadly proverbial of the church that sometimes we keep ourselves so insulated that we can't actually reach out and share Christ's love with those around us. You know, we read verses like James 1.27 that tell us to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And so we bundle up and we insulate ourselves against all the evil around us. We only hang out with Christians or, or those who are like good people that are kind of like us. You know, that's, that's good enough too. And we only listen to Caleb and we, we, we just want to stay where it's safe. And if we could only find just a little more bubble wrap for our Christian life, then we'd be good. And we're protected all right. We're also useless. We can't not just put our arms down, but we can't reach out to touch somebody near us that needs to know of the grace and love of Jesus Christ. You know, in the church, we tend to overprotect and underreach, but then we look at Jesus. And when he approached a leper, a man unclean, a man shunned from society, contagious, he doesn't just heal him with a word from a safe distance in a hazmat suit. Instead, he steps close and he reaches out his hand and he touches the man that hasn't been touched in years. And as he touches him, he transfers his holiness onto him, his grace onto him, his life, his cleanness onto him. And he changes everything for this man. See, that is exactly how we Christians should operate in the world that we would be so contagious with God's grace that everybody we rub shoulders with, we rub off a little bit of Jesus on them. You know, John Orberg says it this way. He's a pastor in the Bay Area. I love what he has to say. He says, the secret is to be so filled with the life of Jesus that in touching the world, instead of it's affecting us, we infect it. And so what would it look like for us to start living that way? What, what if we Christians actually lived in the world in such a way that the world around us could uh, just unmistakably see Jesus through us? What would it look like in your life? In the people that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, if they could see Jesus through a loving touch. See, the, the command here for us is that we need to make God's grace contagious through our touch. We need to interact with the world around us, make God's grace contagious through our touch. So what would that look like for you? Maybe is it, you know, who is it in your life that you struggle to interact with, but, but you know they need Jesus? Is it somebody of a different culture or background or language or sexual orientation or lifestyle or, or income bracket or whatever the case may be? Or is it somebody close to you? Somebody maybe even your own house or in your own family, but you struggle with them. And you'd love to keep your distance but they need Jesus. And you know God wants you to reach out and to show Christ's love and grace to them. You know, I saw a beautiful example of, of sharing his love through touch a couple weeks ago as a, 101 of you from our church went and served with Love, Inc. And uh, 101, out of that 101, here's 30 of our college and young adults who are out there. God's doing an awesome thing in this group, right? Yeah, well, that was, that was, that was good. Um, <laughs> God's rocking in there. It's, it's pretty sweet. But here's 30 of 101 who went and served in our community. 
and took love in the name of Christ into homes where they didn't have a mattress or they didn't have a bed or they didn't have a dresser or a, or a table and chairs to sit on and eat at. And these homes that you could easily look at and say, no, that, that area, that's untouchable. Don't drive to those parts. That apartment complex, that ain't safe. Or you could look at those people and you might be tempted to think that they're less than or unclean. But 101 of you from our church, you stepped up with this organization, Love, Inc., to go and to be Jesus' love tangibly, through touch, through delivering goods, and through praying with them, through sharing the gospel with them. And 41 families in our community were, were, were met in that. That's, that's what it looks like. You know, in your personal life, it can look all kinds of ways. For me, one of the things I try to do is if I ever interact with somebody who's homeless or needy, whether or not I can meet the need they're asking for, I do my best to ask their name and to shake their hand, no matter how dirty it might be, because they're so used to people looking at them as less than human or ignoring them and turning the other way. And I want to be a face on grace for them. And I do this so imperfectly, but I try my best to reach out my hand, to shake theirs, and to put a face on grace. You know, or, or in my interactions with my kids, uh, you know, families around my kids at their school, I try to walk in and, and to get to know some of them, or with my son's basketball team, to meet these parents and these kids from all different walks of life and different relational backgrounds and different lifestyle choices and different sexual orientation and, and all of this. And I just want them to see Jesus through me as I high-five their kid and I play with their son on the basketball court or as I interact with these parents. I want them to see Jesus. And you know what's really fun? Most of them don't even know I'm a pastor. And, and they just get to see somebody who genuinely cares. Not because he's paid to, not because, well, that's what's expected because he's a pastor, but just that they would see somebody who genuinely cares for them. I want to be contagious through loving touch of all those around me that they would rub shoulders with me and that they would leave touched by Jesus. What would it look like for that in our lives? See, that's what we see in this first half of our passage, but we're only halfway there. So let's keep moving. Verse 14. Let's see the response. Then Jesus ordered him, Don't tell anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Now, I read this part, and I don't get this either. Like, Jesus doesn't want him to spread the word quite yet. Like, why, why wouldn't Jesus just say, well, well, go and tell everybody about what I just did to you? Like carpe diem, Jesus sees this moment. You could, you could have everybody knowing that you're the Messiah, but Jesus knows better. And Jesus knows that if he goes and presents himself to the priest, now it won't just be one man who's telling his story. That may or may not be true, but it's a man who's been substantiated by the priests. And now the priests are telling the story, and others are telling the story. And so I envision this man, and he goes, and he walks confidently to the priest, which he never could have done before his cleansing. And I got to imagine these priests are just blown away by this. You know, they, they've never seen or heard of anything like this happening before. You know, they, they've heard stories from the Old Testament, but really in the Old Testament, there's only a few there even. And so now this man comes claiming to be cleansed from leprosy, and they kind of recognize him because they've, they've seen him out there before. And so they've got to figure out how, how to do this purification ritual. See, they'd learned about it back in rabbi school, in Leviticus 14, they flip back for a reminder because, you know, we all learn those things in school that we think, well, I'm never going to have to reply, apply this in life, right? You, you guys know what I'm talking about. You guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay. And so, so they learned this back in school, and they're like, I don't need this. You know, I'm never going to actually purify somebody who's been cleansed by leprosy. This doesn't happen. Now it's happened. So they flip back. Leviticus 14, and they read what's supposed to happen. Turns out it comes in two phases. First, the priest would come and meet the man outside of town. He'd come up to the priest, and the priest would, would just kind of look at him and, and, and inspect and make sure that there's no sign of leprosy on his body anywhere. And as he sees that, they would take a bird, and they'd perform a sacrifice, and there'd be some blood and some water, and they'd sprinkle it, and they'd, that was a form and a, a symbol of, of purification. And then he'd send him away for a week, and during that week, he's halfway there. He can go home, but he can't go in. 
So he comes back a week later, presents himself to the priest again. The priest inspects him, looks him over, makes sure there's no sign of leprosy. And if there's not, they would slaughter a lamb. And with that sacrifice, he would take some of the blood of that lamb and he'd put it on the right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and the big toe of his right foot if those appendages happened to still be attached. And that would symbolize sanctifying what here is an acts and walks in the service of the Lord now. And at that, the man's restored to community. He's welcomed back in. He can go home. He can hug and kiss his wife and his kids. And these two phases are complete, and he is clean. But again, I'm picturing these priests who've never seen this before, have never done this before, and they have to be blown away at the realization of what's going down right in front of them. I mean, yeah, enough that a miracle has taken place, that a man has been healed, but even more, what's amazing is, is that they now have a glimpse at who Jesus is. Watch this, verse 14. He tells him to go and present himself as a testimony to the priests. As a testimony to them. As a testimony to what? As a testimony that the Messiah is here. You see, the healing of lepers is a sign of the Messiah's coming. The healing of lepers is a sign of the Messiah's coming. Even Jesus, when he's asked in a couple chapters later by John the Baptist, Hey, Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Jesus points to, among other things, well, lepers are being healed, so there's that points to that as a proof of him being the Messiah. And so he sends this man to present himself to the religious leaders, not only to be cleansed, but to, to be a testimony to them that the Messiah is here. And now it's not only this man who's been healed who's telling his story. Now the priests are too. Now the people who witnessed this are sharing the story too. Man, you can't believe what happened at work today, sweetheart. Like, this, this man was, was cleansed, and I, I got to perform this ritual, and all these people are going home, and they're saying, you wouldn't believe what I saw in town today. This man, he came up with bumps all over, and, and then he left just clean and restored, and like, he grew back limbs, like, whoop, it was crazy, it was super cool. And they're going home, and they're telling this story. The friends and the neighbors are telling the story as they saw this man deformed and decaying and his body being put back together now. His wife, his children, they're telling the story. The story's gone contagious. It's spreading. And we read right here, it's spreading all over. Spread all the more. The crowds and the people that came to hear Jesus and to be healed of their sicknesses. You see, it's not enough. It's not enough for us to spread God's grace through our touch. We also need to share it through our testimony. We need to be contagious with God's grace through our testimony. It's not enough to make his grace contagious just through our touch. Oh, that's important, all right. See, people won't care what you have to tell them about Jesus until they see that you genuinely care about them. But you gotta go further. You gotta share your words, share your story as well. Maybe you've heard this idea to preach the gospel always and use words when necessary. It's a quote attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. And I like it. Preach the gospel always and use words when necessary. I like that. That's how we need to live. We need to preach the gospel always through everything that we say, everything that we do, every interaction we have, all our attitudes, every time we interact with somebody else that they would leave seeing Jesus. That's our desire. But sometimes we use this as a cop-out. And we say, well, preach the gospel always and use words when necessary. Like, I, I'm just more, I don't really want to, like, tell my testimony to somebody. I want to get into the gospel because that makes people feel uncomfortable. So I just like to love you know, I just like to, to serve. I just like to do good things. I, I like to, to live in such a way that maybe they'll see I'm different. And that's good, but sometimes it's a cop-out because we need to go beyond that and be able to share about how Jesus has transformed our life. We can't stop there. Got to make God's grace contagious through our touch, yes, but also spread the gospel through our testimony. We need to be sharing our stories of how God has impacted our lives every chance we get. We need to look for open doors and share boldly because Jesus is the hope of the world. And some of you, you're sitting here and you're saying, yeah, that sounds really good, but I don't know how to do that. 
That's okay. Let me give you a few options that your church can help you with. Number one is coming up this afternoon. You can hang out with me and Jennifer Sand. We're going to do a shape workshop and help you understand how to contagiously spread God's gospel and his grace through your touch and your testimony. Uniquely how God's gifted and skilled and, and given you a personality. What does that look like for you? You know, serving a free lunch, you get to hang out with me for a few hours. I mean, who doesn't want that, right? Okay, so that's today. That's one option. Another thing is coming up in a few weeks, we have our Share Your Story workshop, and we'll help you craft your testimony in such a way that it'll be shared with others where they might encounter Jesus, maybe for the first time. And you can find details for that in Creekside Life magazine. And something else you can find in there is this summer, Creekside University. There's going to be a couple opportunities where, number one, you can know what you believe a little bit more deeply through a doctrine, doctrine class and get, get to understand what you believe and how to apply it in your life so you can be more confident as you enter into evangelistic conversations. And then another one where you can have practical ideas of how to interact with your neighbors, your friends, your kids, parents, you know, all those things. So that they can see Jesus. Those are a couple things coming down the pike as well. But if you're here this morning, you're saying, yeah, but I don't know how today. Come up, grab a friend who's going to be up here at the end. Grab me in the atrium or a person you came with and say, help me understand how to share the gospel. Help me understand how to, to, to share this with somebody else, how to tell them about how he's impacted my life because we need to be sharing the stories of how God has impacted our lives every chance we get to look for open doors and to courageously walk through them and to share about God's grace because Jesus is the hope of the world. And some of you, some of you are here and you may not understand entirely what that means, but when I say Jesus is the hope of the world, here's what I mean. That as I see him in scripture, you know, just like this leprosy illustration earlier, just like the leper, we're all tainted with sin, we're all, we're all stained, we're all sinful. And it's permeated every bit of our character, every part of our life, tainted by sin. And we stand before a holy and a pure God who cannot interact with that. Yet we have a God who reaches in and touches the untouchable. And so he sent Jesus in to live a perfect life to come to this hellhole we call earth, to live a perfect life, to interact with others, to show his love and grace, to show us who Jesus, to, who God is. And then he goes to the cross and he dies our death, attributes the punishment that we deserve for our sinfulness on himself so that he could then impute his righteousness to us. He takes our sin upon himself so he can impute his righteousness, his holiness, his grace to us. We become pure and clean and clear so we can be restored to a relationship with God like we wouldn't have been able to before. That's what we call the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. And it's good news because it's the only hope we have. And it's available to every single one of us. And so if you're here this morning, you've never taken that step of embracing Jesus as your Lord, like this leper says. As your master. If you've never gone before Jesus and said, Jesus, I need your righteousness to cover over my sin. I, I need to stop being, trying to be good enough because I realize my sin has permeated everything. I, I need this. I need your, your, your clean and your clear to come over and wash over me. If you've never done that, I invite you to come up. Talk to one of my friends that's going to be up front at the end here or grab me in the atrium. Grab a friend you came with and ask your questions because Jesus is the hope of the world and there is no other. And so my challenge to you this week is that you'd step into a relationship with Jesus, or if you already have, that you would then take the story that he's written in your life, and that you'd go, and you'd be contagious. And so here's my question to you, as we start closing, is, is this. How will you be contagious with God's grace through your touch or your testimony this week? How does God charge you to be contagious with your touch or your testimony this week? Who is it in your life that desperately needs to hear of God's grace? Maybe even a difficult relationship. Maybe wh what is it or how does he want you to live in such a way that others would see Jesus through you? Even in your life, as you walk through daily life, do other people see Jesus through you? And how you interact and the words that you use and the attitudes you have at work or on the road? Whatever it might be that you would live in such a way that people would see Christ through you. Or maybe there's a layer of insulation you need to take down or take off so that you can enter into a hurting world better. 
You know, one of the things that God has charged me with in the last month and a half here is to stop dropping my kids off at school and driving away. But so now we, we try to get out of the house a few minutes earlier. That's the challenge. And then get there and park, and I walk in with them. And I interact with people on the campus and my kids' friends and their parents. And I try to be Jesus with skin on, very imperfectly. But I want to interact with them and open up doors and opportunities to share about Christ's love and his grace because he so transformed me. So what does that look like for you? Here's, here's how I'd like to close. So I want to give you uh, just 30 seconds in quiet to jot down a couple notes in your, in your sermon notes there. I gave you some space to do this. And I want to ask you to be specific. Who is that person or what is that way that God is calling you to be contagious, to spread this, to share this this week? Don't be generic or you won't do it. But be specific, even just in one way that God is calling you to spread his grace and his love to somebody near you this week. Let me give you some space to do that. I'm going to wrap us up in prayer in just a moment. Almighty God, thank you for this challenge from your word. Thank you for uh, calling us out of our comfort to go and to touch the untouchable, to, to extend your cleansing to the unclean and the hurting and broken world around us. God, you know that we have needed your touch and you've been so faithful to overcome our sin and our struggles with your grace. And we praise you, we thank you for the work you've done in our lives and we pray that you'd help us to go and spread that now. Jesus, I believe you're the hope of the world. I pray that this world would see that, would know that, that it would start here in Elk Grove through this church that, that knows you, that loves you. God, go, go out and do an incredible work through us this week and in the weeks and months and years ahead. Almighty God, I, I pray that as we give back to you this morning our tithes and our offerings, that this would be just a way that we get to express again our gratitude for your cleansing, for your love, that you would, uh, that you would multiply these gifts in such a way that others would hear of your gospel. God, use us, work in us, and through us in the week ahead. In your name, amen. Thank you.